Thanks for joining us here this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so you guys have done a lot of really interesting things with data um, to help solve crime. And uh, first, maybe you could just start by telling me a little bit about what you're each doing in your respective areas. In data? Yeah. Well, Dermot, I'm going to let you start sure. since the NYPD started first. <laughs> well, what, I, what I do and what I'm responsible for in the NYPD is the Office of the Deputy Commissioner of Operations. And, and really, we oversee the entire NYPD across all the different assets and bureaus and, and try to develop and implement crime control strategies. And we assess what we are doing. We, we change. We, we are constantly um, in, in a position where having an awareness of what might have worked last month or last week may not be what we want to do tomorrow. So in, in part of any, in today's day and age in law enforcement, any crime control strategy that we develop, technology is now involved. Um, the, the leaps and bounds that technology has pushed us forward and, and helped to push crime further. Um, uh, we could talk for not 25 minutes, we could talk for 25 days about it. It is, it is interwoven into everything that I think about on a daily basis. The, the data that exists, how to use it, not just how to use it, how to use it effectively, appropriately, um, and deliver it to the men and women of the police department, our officers, our detectives, not just in a manner that can be used, a manner that can be used the most efficiently. The goal in our use of data, and I expect the goal in the use of data by all the organizations out here, is to really understand uh, where you should be focusing your energies and delivering the best result for your business uh, in, those energy, in those areas. And that's the way we approach data in the Manhattan DA's office, particularly now. This sort of use of data revolution in law enforcement really started with the NYPD some decades ago with the current commissioner and people who worked for him called Comstat. Uh, by the time I became DA in 2010, uh, beginning of 2010, uh, I understood that the experience the PD had with Comstat was something that our office could use as a model, not to create the same thing, but to make sure that our office was able to effectively understand what was happening in the field, capture that data, and drive our decision making to be more effective in our uh, strategies in the courtroom and also in crime prevention strategies in the community. Uh, the world uh, has changed a lot, and I think we've had to approach our job as prosecutors differently. We all have to innovate, and I don't need to tell this audience about how important that is. But as a young district attorney in the 1980s working in the Manhattan DA's office, we had 110,000 cases a year homicides, robberies, it was, it was a madhouse. Uh, but the model we ended up using back then was simply case processors. The police would make an arrest, they would bring us the case, we would analyze the case, we'd take it to trial, it would resolve itself one way or the other, and we'd move on to the next case. And that's, we were very reactive, uh, we were very efficient processors. But when I came in in 2010, crime was at historic lows, and the opportunity for me as I saw it was what can a district attorney do when crime is at historic low to drive it even lower? Certainly I wasn't going to sit on my hands and just wait for crime to uptick in order for us to be more engaged. So I viewed my mission coming in as, at a time of low crime, what strategies, what levers could a DA pull that would drive crime even lower? And basically that, that was on focusing who were, uh, how we could identify who was driving crime in Manhattan and focus on those individuals, both because that was the best use of money, sort of like Moneyball, we want to get the best bang for our buck, uh, but we also wanted to make sure that we were not wasting money on strategies that were inefficient. And so what we did was uh, to think uh, about data differently as a DA's office. Uh, with those 100,000 cases, uh, we had never before tried to capture the information that came in from 100,000 cases a year. If you think about it, Dermot keeps a case for 24 hours. A police officer makes a arrest on a gun, keeps the case, and then moves it to the DA's office. We may keep that case for 18 months uh, before it goes to trial. And in that 18 months, you're going to be learning information from witnesses, perhaps from informants, perhaps from the defendant, him or herself, perhaps from the community. And what happened to all that information and intelligence that was collected on this case, 100,000 others each year? Well, what was happening to it, it was being put on yellow legal pads uh, in lawyers' offices and then shipped off-site, never to be heard of again. So we were never capturing the information, uh, the intelligence information that we were 
gathering uh, in our office, and as a result, we were losing a lot of information that would be helpful to us in identifying who were the crime drivers and not able to share that information around the office to make us more efficient. So when I came in, we started what's called the Crime Strategies Unit in the office. That is designed to be a, an intelligence unit within the district attorney's office. It works in cooperation with the police department, but the job of the Crime Strategies Unit is to take lawyers, but no longer have those lawyers training, trying cases. They're now really intelligence agents and overseeing intelligence analysts. And their job is in every neighborhood uh, and in every hotspot to tell me who's driving crime. And then it is our job to, through the assimilation of information all over the office, some of it historical, that is now we are able to capture better and digest better, rationalize and push out, and working with the, TD, uh, with the PD, uh, give information to the assistants doing investigations and trying cases to make their cases stronger. The backbone of this, Alyssa, uh, is uh, what we call a uh, arrest alert system. We know who's driving crime. We know who we're looking for. Uh, that's sometimes not too hard. You can go to any precinct commander and he or she will tell you who are the 15 people in that precinct who are causing a disproportionate amount of crime. The point is that when you've identified the folks who are driving crime, you have to make sure that every time they come into the system, we know it. And we know it right away so that those cases can be focused upon and treated seriously. It's more paying attention to who the person is rather than what the charge is. Right. Because we have, if we have an active shooter or gang member who comes in and is arrested on a misdemeanor assault case, we need to know right away that person's in, in, uh, in the system. We need to uh, speak right away with the young assistant in the middle of the night who's writing up that case to, to make sure she knows this is just not a simple assault case. Yeah. This is a simple assault case we have to treat seriously. And so that's really the philosophy. It's, it's understanding much more who's driving crime the PD is one of our principal partners in that, then focusing our energies and intelligence to push that information out to our assistants so they can do a better job. And, uh, and in some cases, as I say, in real time in the middle of the night. Right. And I understand that those two systems working together, CompuStat and uh, CS, uh, the crime, CSU, CSU yeah. um, they, they've been particularly effective at taking down gangs in certain neighborhoods. Uh, can you maybe just walk me through the steps of like if you happen to pick up uh, a gang member on uh, a, a small maybe like robbery charge and, and what you find out once you enter them into the database? Well, so if I can, I'm just, I'll, I'll give you a non-gang case. To, okay, because sure. That's, because the focus of this unit has been on violent crime. As I think a district attorney's office, you have to keep your eye on violent crime. But there are these people who disproportionately affect our you know, our, our experience here in New York City. So there was a gentleman uh, named Naeem Jabbar uh, when I first came in. Naeem was basically a career hustler, and he would operate in Midtown here, and his MO was to bump into unwitting tourists, people like some of us, uh, big bump, drop his glasses. He'd previously broken the glasses, but he picks the glasses up, and then he harangues the tourist. You mm. broke my glasses, give me 20 bucks, give me 40 bucks. Catchy. So if this happens, <laughs> probably happened to some people here, but it is a quality of life offense that actually really matters. And this guy was a pro. He had had 35 convictions, one for a felony. He'd never done more than 60 days in jail. So he became a member of our crime strategies targets. And when Naeem was picked up the, you know, the hundredth time uh, by the police and brought in, in the middle of the night, our assistant had a, you know, she knew who Naeem was. She had a dossier on him. Uh, and she was able to, instead of charging a simple larceny or pettit larceny case, which we traditionally would, she was more aggressive. And she operated on a robbery theory, that he was using force when he was intimidating uh, the, 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 the visitor and threatening that person uh, to give money. So Naeem thought it was outrageous, thought robbery was outrageous, to, wouldn't take a plea deal. And he ended up getting indicted for robbery and doing three and a half years to seven. So that's an example of focusing on the guys who are causing the trouble being able to ident know who they are, being able to push that information right at the beginning of the case to the assistant writing it up, and then being able to be aggressive at every step to say to the judge, this isn't a run-of-the-mill case. This guy is really having a disproportionate impact. And by the way, if you judge, don't take this seriously, it's going to be just like the other 40 judges who didn't take it seriously before. Right. It's really interesting. Um, and so I know that this information definitely empowers both of your departments, but I, I also understand that with more information, that uh, sort of opens the door for 
perhaps abuse in some sense. Um, and uh, I know that some critics have brought up that this might bring up civil liberty issues. Um, maybe you guys could speak to the checks and balance you have um, yeah. to, to try and prevent um, a person's racial bias coming through and connecting these dots or something like that. Sure. Well, we, we right now as the NYPD have probably more monitoring uh, than we have ever had. We have a civilian complaint review board. We have an independent monitor. We have the inspector general. We, fr quite frankly, we have DAs that will review our cases. And, and we, we recognize that we are far from perfect. And, and the, my point here is that we understand that we do make mistakes, um, but there is an incredible level of um, scrutiny and monitoring that goes into effect. Um, but uh, spinning the question a different way, there, there is information out there, and we're talking about data, and we're talking about technology. And I want my officers to work for the victim. A and the victim has an expectation that the crime that they were victimized of, whether it be a simple crime, whether it be a more heinous crime, is investigated thoroughly, and the person that's, uh, that committed this crime is brought to, to, brought to justice. Um, so we, we will do whatever we, will, we can. We will do it appropriately. Um, do we make mistakes? We absolutely do. Uh, and we will make sure that going, f going uh, additionally forward, training will be, will be conducted to correct any mistakes that we make. But we are, we are very confident that um, any, any, any strategies that we develop, we, we use the data available just like the criminal uses the data. The, the only difference is that I have four agencies monitoring how we use that data. Unfortunately, the criminal is subjected to none of those same monitors. Right. <laughs> what I would add to Dermot is that, of course, you, law enforcement is a business. It's an institution. It's a, it's a, civil, it's a municipal agency. And of course, we are going to, we, are, we have to collect data uh, because it's brought to us all the time by police officers and others. So we, we, of course, the information come in has to be collected, it has to be organized, and it has to be assimilated. Uh, that, there's nothing wrong with that uh, in, in understanding what your data is. Uh, otherwise, you're not doing your job. Uh, we feel we know, working with the NYPD, who is behind crime in every community in Manhattan or have a good sense. Uh, but we also know that people who may look like they're involved in something today may go out and no longer be in crime for a number of reasons. They may be, they may be arrested. Uh, they may be back in the system. They may have gone to another, they may have gone to another state. They may have completed their probation term and, and are not involved in anything. Um, and so we are constantly, when we're looking at our crime drivers, that is a constantly evolving list. People being pulled off uh, because they, we do, do not believe they are I any more involved in, in, in or should be a focus anymore, and people added on. To the second point, though, is I think we all depend on the quality of um, integrity of the people who work in our businesses and our agencies to make sure that we aren't approaching things in a biased, uh, or in a bi -way, biased way. And I think agencies like ours, we, it, we have a responsibility to, at the very beginning, talk to our young assistants about issues like implicit bias uh, and to make sure that people understand that uh, they, we need to always keep our, our uh, focus, our charging decisions on the facts, not let our emotions and, and other factors like bias creep in. So, how, so in our office, we, I, I think it's important that we do that. I think if I'm asked to opine about is this organization biased or uh, was stop and frisk a, a, a racially motivated thing, I felt like the Manhattan DA's office got to do its own review about its own work right. to determine whether or not we have a problem. So I brought the Vera Institute of Justice. It's a nationally recognized uh, sort of government-focused uh, think tank here in, in New York. And I had them do a racial bias review uh, of our office, uh, looking at our charging policies, our plea bargaining policies, our sentence recommendations, and the like. And they, it was a two- or three-year process. Their recommendations were very helpful to me in understanding where there were statistical differences in sentence recommendations between an African-American and uh, a, a, a white man, for example. And it helped me understand what levers I needed to be focused on and what levers I needed to pull uh, in order to address what was at least statistically a problem, not necessarily biased, but, but, but it, there was a distinction. And we have implicit bias training in our office. Um, so these are things that are not typical for law enforcement. 
but I think are going to increasingly become typical because as we have information that lets us be much more powerful, keep information longer, we also need to make sure that our assistants understand uh, they can't abuse their power. They have to look inside and make sure that they're doing things right. Right. Um, and really quickly, because we just have a couple more minutes here, but uh, I, from what I understand now, other major urban areas are adopting these same data-driven policies that you guys have sort of been at the forefront of. Um, and I know that you've sort of helped them come along. Um, but what are the challenges of applying this local uh, model to uh, an area that might have completely different issues when it comes to crime? Maybe you could start. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll address the, the first part of the question. Uh, Comstat has been around and, and I think widely held uh, for, for over 20 years now as a real game changer in the law enforcement community. And we, we have weekly meetings. We have visitors to this day coming in to see what we're doing. Uh, at the same time, we, we visit other areas. And we are not of the mind that we know everything, because shame on us if we are. There is always something to learn. But when you, when you talk about taking, taking uh, one strategy and applying it to other areas of the country, um, maybe in a broad sense, but there is no cookie cutter approach here. And, and every community is different. Uh, I would say that uh, unique problems need, need unique strategies, and it's a, it's a constant process of, uh, you know, not only what the problems are in a particular area, but what the laws are in a particular area. Um, you know, and, and for example, in our office, we, we can, uh, arrests being made are easy. What is, the, what is the real net result on the end? Are, are we spending our time wisely making a particular arrest? Uh, for example, with the, dr the, the drug attitude in this country has changed dramatically. We've had the repeal of the Rockefeller drug laws. Are we changing our narcotics strategy? Are we going about business the same way? So in the law enforcement world, it's, it, it really is results driven. We want to develop strategies, but it cannot be the same everywhere. It cannot within New York City be the same strategy in Brooklyn that we use in Manhattan. Everything is uh, constantly being evaluated. In our crime strategies unit, Alyssa, uh, I think of all, first of all, this, this is kind of a game changer for prosecutions, focusing on intelligence-driven prosecution as opposed to reactive. Uh, the mayor has funded, our, we started a crime strategies unit, funded it ourselves. The mayor has now funded crime strategies units for all the other counties in the city. Uh, Baltimore, East Baton Rouge, Louisiana, uh, uh, San Francisco, uh, Philadelphia. We actually hold seminars now uh, in our office to four other prosecutors' offices talking about how to build a, pro a crime strategies unit. And to answer your question, it's not dependent upon, it's, it's not dependent upon uh, geography. The, the philosophy of identifying your crime drivers, uh, of focusing on violence crime, using technology, uh, sophistication of technology to be able to gather information uh, about who's committing crime. These are uh, though everyone's going to do that differently, but in my view, a, we live in a vertical city, a vertical county, but a horizontal county like Houston, Texas, they're going to apply the same philosophies, but they're going to implement it differently because their geography is different. But Houston's still going to want to know in this ward who are the 25 people who are most involved in violent crime and driving crime, and that's the same question we ask, although it may be for a vertical neighborhood in Johnson Houses in East Harlem. I see. And, and finally, just super quick, I'm curious if any of the higher level criminals have caught on to your strategies and come up with ways to sort of uh, dodge them. Well, I can say real quickly, Rikers phone calls, Rikers Island is the correctional facility over in the Bronx which houses pretrial detainees and people who were sentenced for short periods. Those phone calls are, are recorded and the inmates know it. But listening to those phone calls, they absolutely know in Manhattan that there is a crackdown on gangs. And so we've taken down 15 gangs with the NYPD since five years ago, hundreds of gang members off the streets. They're talking about it. I mean, this, this, this does have deterrent impact. Uh, it's not perfect deterrent impact, but we know that young men and women who are in this world understand that this is being taken seriously and there's serious risk if they are in gangs and operating here. And do you have there, there, are, there are very few secrets. So w when we do catch someone, 
and, and bring that individual to Sai and, and his district attorneys successfully prosecute. You get to a point where everything is on the table. Everything is discoverable. The, the defendant at some point will learn literally everything that went into building that case. And those secrets quickly make it downstream. So whether it's collecting DNA and wearing gloves or hiding your face for DNA or switching your license plates to avoid license plate readers, there is a constant cat and mouse game. And, and trying to adapt and move quicker than them is, is the nature of the business that we're in. So absolutely there is changing strategies both on our side and on the criminal side. Alyssa, can I just say that partnership and collaboration is key in, in what we do. The work the NYPD does as a collaborative partnership is incredible. Uh, the communities in, in Manhattan have also become collaborative and essential partners. Communities want crime out of their neighborhoods. And they are often the ones who tell us there's a drug set on 125th and such and such. Would you look at it, please? It's, that is so much more about how we are doing our job collaboratively, law enforcement community, uh, making sure that if we take a big dang takedown, that we follow it up with community support uh, for the kids in that neighborhood. When you take the beach, you got to keep the beach, and that means you've got to have uh, a good strategy with the NYPD and the DA's office to work with the community positively and let them know that it's not just about who we want to take out of their community, it's what we want to put into it also. It helps that you guys get along then. Yes, <laughs> yes it does. I think that's a great ending point. Thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.